Hello, everyone. My name is Dan Mitchell of the Cato Institute. On behalf of the Center for Freedom and Prosperity, thanks for taking time to learn more about a key economic issue. Today, we're going to talk about the Laffer Curve. This is the hotly debated notion that tax cuts, at least in some circumstances, generate additional revenue. And it's named for Art Laffer, an economist who was an advisor to Ronald Reagan. Let's look at this graph of the Laffer Curve. As you can see, we spared no expense to put it together. My son even got a B in his art class for this. It's based on the simple and presumably uncontroversial proposition that government won't collect any revenue if tax rates are zero. This is point A. But neither will government collect any money when tax rates are 100%, which is point C. After all, who's going to work if politicians seize every penny you make? Art then explained that there is a revenue-maximizing tax rate, which, just for the heck of it, we'll call point B. Dr. Laffer explained that the top federal tax rate, which was 70% back in the 1970s, was so high that it discouraged the people in that tax bracket from engaging in productive behavior, and it encouraged them to figure out ways of hiding income from the IRS. When tax rates got this high, Art explained, governments could lower the rates and actually collect more revenue since people would have more incentives to both earn additional income and to report that money to the IRS. In other words, the 70% tax rate was so high that we were on the wrong side or the downward sloping side of the Laffer curve, somewhere between points B and C. This meant, of course, that it was possible to lower the tax rate and collect more tax revenue. Let's look at a quick example. Let's say that people in the highest tax bracket are willing to report $100 billion of taxable income when the rate is 70%, but they are willing to report $300 billion when the rate is 28%. Now, you don't need to be a math genius to see that the revenue feedback is so large that the politicians get more tax revenue. Now let's consider some of the implications. Let's stop right here. This point needs to be emphasized so we understand how the Laffer curve operates. As this graph illustrates, if we raise the tax rate from 15% to 20%, tax revenues will rise from point D to point E. Revenues climb because, even though people may not like the higher tax rate, it's still at a reasonable level, so it's not going to cause big changes in behavior or have a big effect on economic performance. But what happens if the tax rate rises from 25% to 30%? Revenues still rise from point F to point G, but the revenue increase is tiny because the tax rate is reaching a level where people do change their behavior, and the decline in taxable income almost offsets the impact of the higher tax rate. This means, by the way, the government is imposing a lot of damage to get very little additional revenue. And when the tax rate jumps from 45% to 50%, revenues actually decline from point H to point I. This is because the incentive to work, save, and invest falls a lot, and the incentive to evade and avoid the tax man rises a lot. Now, back to our regularly scheduled programming. Now let's consider some of the implications of the Laffer curve and also dismiss some of the myths. There are three things you should understand. First, notwithstanding the previous example and notwithstanding the exaggerated claims of some politicians, the Laffer curve does not mean that all tax cuts pay for themselves. Indeed, it is only in very rare cases that this happens. There's pretty good evidence that tax collections from the rich rose when Reagan cut the top tax rate from 70% to 28%. There's also lots of data showing that reductions in capital gains tax rates have increased tax receipts, largely because taxpayers easily can avoid the levy by holding on to assets when the tax rate is too high, but they are willing to sell assets and pay a tax when the rate is reasonable. But in the vast majority of cases, we're on the left side or upward sloping side of the Laffer curve. This doesn't mean that we shouldn't lower tax rates when we're between points A and point B. The economy will improve and taxable incomes will rise, but the increase in taxable income will not be enough to offset the effect of the lower tax rate. There will be revenue feedback, in other words, but not enough to make a tax cut self-financing. Second, the amount of revenue feedback varies depending on how you cut taxes. Supply-side tax cuts, such as income tax rate reductions, capital gains tax rate reductions, and dividend tax rate reductions, will generate Laffer curve effects because they reduce the tax penalty on productive behavior. And when people respond by working more, saving more, and investing more, the result is more taxable income. The actual level of revenue feedback depends on the situation, of course. Other tax cuts, though, such as expanded credits, deductions, and exemptions, 
are unlikely to have any significant impact on incentives to engage in productive behavior. This is because the marginal tax rates on additional increments of work, saving, and investment are probably unchanged. This doesn't necessarily mean these are bad tax cuts. It just means that they don't lead to meaningful changes in taxable income, so there is little or no revenue feedback. Third, I definitely want to stress that point B is not where we want to be on the Laffer curve. The revenue maximizing point may be here, but the growth maximizing point will be somewhere on the upward sloping section of the curve. Now, I don't like government spending very much, so I'm tempted to say it's point A. But there are core public goods that help a market economy function. Things like rule of law, public safety, honest courts. And while I'm not fixated on whether revenues and spending balance in any particular year, it's not a bad idea to pay for the legitimate functions of government as those costs occur. Now, it goes without saying, of course, that a simple and fair flat tax is the best way to finance those expenses. So let's reiterate. Government could collect more revenue by climbing the upward portion of the curve and raising the tax rate closer to point B, but it would be very costly in terms of lost economic growth and lower pre-tax incomes for workers. So let's sum up what we've learned. We know there's a Laffer curve. Heck, even John Maynard Keynes wrote that, quote, a reduction of taxation will run a better chance than an increase of balancing the budget, end quote. But we also know that some people on both sides of the debate exaggerate. Yes, there are a few tax cuts that may pay for themselves, but the vast majority of tax cuts are not in that category. And it's also true that there are some tax cuts that generate zero revenue feedback, but those also are rare cases. This concludes part one of our series on the Laffer Curve. I invite you to watch part two, which reviews the evidence showing that the right kinds of tax cuts mean substantial revenue feedback, and also part three, which explains why the revenue estimating system used in Washington needs to be modernized. As always, please share this video with your friends and colleagues. On behalf of the Center for Freedom and Prosperity, I'm Dan Mitchell. Thanks for watching.